Welcome, I'm so glad you're joining me. For those of you who are just starting, the Orca Swim Show is a weekly show where I bring both information about how the brain works when embarking on change, especially something that is fearful, and we take it to the lab of the swimming pool. After 30 years of teaching in the pool, it's time to hop out of the water and share how the learning works in and out of the water in the same way. The water is a perfect lab to test the learning process because you get fast and immediate feedback along with very satisfying rewards. When you focus on the needs of the brain-body connection and not just a list of skills, then you can obtain lasting and satisfying results. Our pool is a warm 92. Let's hop in and go from regret and missing out to action and freedom. Hi, welcome to our first episode. I'm Corey Micah. I have been teaching adults how to overcome fear and to take action so they can find freedom in deep water. I've been doing this for over 15 years. I've been teaching swimming for even longer than that. This series of shows is a new way for us to deliver this material. It's a new way for me to be with you. And I am just thrilled that you're here with me today. Each episode, there is going to be information about what goes into learning something new, having the correct mindset, um, lessons that of the way life works and things that you can apply in your life right now before you even go to the pool that help inform your practice at the pool or on any leading edge that you wanna take in your life. And then I also combined it with information that I have gathered and learned and know from my vast many, many years of teaching and working with adults. So thank you for joining me on this journey. When I first meet students at the pool, one of the things that we talk about is how they're feeling right now. And usually when people first come, they're excited, they wanna do it, and they're a little nervous and unsure how it's gonna happen. Quite honestly, that's how I'm feeling a bit right now. I am super excited to be doing this and starting this new journey with you, and I'm a little nervous, so I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> Anyways, I did want to start because I do have a vast uh, background in swimming and expertise, and so I thought I would share a little bit to start with so you can get to know me a little bit. So uh, this story I'm going to start with starts back um, 20 years ago when my boyfriend, who later became my husband, uh, and I were sitting in the living room of the house that I rented with three other post-college women. It was a dreamy time of life where we found pleasure in sitting on the lumpy hand-me-down couch that we got for free. And, um, and the biggest stress that we had really at that time was conversations about the chore wheel and who was doing and not doing their tasks. It was during that time that we came up with the idea of creating Orca Swim School. It was in this urban, transient place that Orca was conceived. Now, 20 years later, I'm reminded of this time as I've been developing the newest version of our business to go beyond the city limits and to be able to reach far and wide. Our life now includes a 17-year-old who's getting ready to launch out on his own shared living experience. The stress is no longer about uh, being responsible for chores, but have I taught him to be responsible for chores as he's going to go out and be a good or a bad roommate uh, next year when he goes off to college. When we chose the name Orca, it had much to do with the grace and the beauty of its swim and the symbolic nature of the orca whale here in the Pacific Northwest. It also had to do with my husband's tagline that we really never used, but 
upon reflection, it has really been the underpinning of what we have done. The tagline was, swim like an intelligent mammal. This set the tone of our journey, that we have not just been about imparting skills, but looking at what the brain needs to be able to learn. This has always been a top priority. Emails from us often start with a line that says, born swimmers. This is because there is never a question if people are or are not swimmers. It is more a question of have you gone through the steps to discover your swimmer? The question, has your brain or the essence of who you are been met in just the right place in order for you to be your true self? In this case, your true swimmer self, to allow your true swimmer self to emerge. Is that confusing? <laughs> Let me give a little side chunk example here. When we look at babies, we all see the potential in them as walkers, talkers, readers, bike riders, and so on. It is rarely that we think that they do not have the capacity for these things. It is more a matter of giving them the opportunity to discover within themselves the steps of these things. Reading is a great sideways example. We assume that most everyone has the capacity for reading. Some of us seem to just get it simply by, read, by being, ex, being read to, by being exposed to it. Like my cousin who is reading a chapter book at the age of three. Others, like my son, it took much longer. Um, we needed to be very deliberate with the steps uh, that were designed just for his brain. For both children, the parents, in this case my aunt and myself, we held the belief that these children, these human beings, were readers. It was just a matter of making sure they got the right steps for their brain that, to have their readerness emerge. Learning anything including swimming, requires meeting your brain. This shows up in many different ways that can be discovered by understanding one's beliefs. Back to the reading I mentioned, the parents of both the early reader and the late reader believed that the child had the capacity to read. This gave space to ask the questions of what steps are needed. For my son, we had applied the steps of reading to him like my aunt did for my cousin, but this was not meeting him at his place. If I kept applying this strategy on him, I may have started to change my belief about him as a reader. Instead, we kept true to our belief that he is a reader and we kept asking, what's a smaller step? How can we meet him in his place where he can be engaged in his reader self. Our beliefs underpin everything we do. The natural thing for our brain to do is to set about proving our beliefs. I am starting this series talking about floating because there are some common community beliefs about floating that inhibit people's learning. As a side note, when I say community beliefs, this is in, re in reference to beliefs that we do not know where they came from. Uh, this would be in the realm of bias. Uh, why do we have racial, age, gender biases? Not necessarily because we were explicitly told to have these things, but because of our whole cultural experience. For example, racial, racial bias towards white people is not based in any facts that whiteness is somehow inherently better, and it is not based on actual evidence. Yet as a community, this is a common belief that is acted upon every day in many large and small ways without our noticing, and thus stops us as a social group from making change in the results for equal value for all people.
In swimming, there are two common beliefs that people uphold that they have gotten from this community belief. One is that floating is required for swimming. Two, that floating should be horizontal to the surface of the water. When learning to swim without a system to notice your beliefs, the natural thing for your brain to do is to prove your beliefs. If you want to change the results of your swimming, you must first look at the beliefs you are coming in with. Not in judgment of it, but in observation of them. Just like if we want to make a change in, in our big social biases around race and gender and age and so on, we must neutrally bring to light the biases and beliefs that we have inherited as being part of society. So in the context of this short little video, we're not going to fix the big issues <laughs> like race and gender and ageism and so on. But it does start with us in tiny little spaces at home. And one place that you can play with it and start to and really see it is in the water. It, the water is a great place to give you some immediate feedback because your beliefs will show up right away. This is why we started the lesson about floating, to understand what floating is a little bit. And in a minute here, we're going to switch over um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, I'm going to pull up an old lesson that, where I taught about it. But for now, uh, the thing that you can also do is really start to notice how your beliefs create the results that you have in your life. As we go through these series, I'll take further deeper dives into these topics to explain and flesh them out some more and show some real life examples that you can start to use in your life. And of course, you can start to take it to the pool as a really, we see the pool as a really good lab in which to test out how life works. Before we switch over to the lesson about how floating works and what buoyancy is all about, to really sort of hmm, test out what are my beliefs about this. I did want to give you an opportunity and an invitation. If you do find this interesting, if the information about how floating works is interesting to you and you do want to start to understand it in the lab of the water, we have our full courses are online and you are welcome to check that out and we would love to see you there or to pop into one of our free webinars. Thank you so much for listening to this first episode. Continue on to hear more about the beliefs about how floating works. Till next time. I'm Corey Micah, owner of Orca Swim School. This is part of our series about questions and myths of swimming. Today we're talking about what floating is. Everybody assumes in order to be a great swimmer, I have to be a great floater. And everybody assumes that floating is something you do. I get in the water and I make myself like Superman, put my arms and my legs out nice and straight so I can be as flat to the surface of the water as possible. This just isn't true. Um, so first, some information about floating, what it is. So I got this little guy, my little helper here, my little rubber air filled guy. If I were to put him in the water, what would happen? Well, let's see, he will float. There he is floating on the water. He's not doing anything. He's not supermanning his arms. He's just floating because that's his properties. Now, I also have this guy. This is a rock. If I put a rock in the water, it will, well, sink <laughs> like a rock. The rock isn't doing anything different. I didn't teach one to do one thing or one to do another. It's just a property. And our bodies are the same way. Some parts of our bodies are more floaty. That would be the parts that are filled with air or fat. There are other parts of our bodies that are less floaty, that are more dense, are the bones part, the muscle part. That's why most people float like this our head up here and our feet down here. This is because our feet have no air 
and very little fat, lots of bone and muscle. So they tend to sink. Our upper part of our bodies, full of air, these big air sacs up here, that tends to be the floaty part. This is a perfectly great way to be a floater in the water. People who float like this or even like this are um, great swimmers. Our Olympic swimmers, in fact, don't float at all doesn't prevent them from being amazing swimmers. So wherever your floating is, up or down or near the surface, it's perfectly great to learn how to swim. Thanks for listening. Are you ready to take some action? Three ways to the freeway. Subscribe, join a free webinar, get started online where we break down the steps, making them simple, and we support you along the journey. So maybe you'll join us in Hawaii. Jump on over to orcaswimschool.com.